iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz. The best or nothing. I'm Michael Riedel for iHeartRadio Broadway, and we are here at the 2019 Meet the Tony nominees. Now, you've done uh, Jersey Boys. Mm Mm-hmm. The Donna Summer musical, right. The Temptations. Right. Are you the catalog go-to catalog guy? Or are you you going to break away from I've this? I've done 27 uh, productions, Michael, since <laughs> yeah. Jersey Boys. Yes. And Everybody. So I've done three <laughs> biographies, three. And uh, happily, they've been, um, you know, uh, uh, successful, and particularly... Uh, uh, this appears to be quite successful. If I could take that to the casino, <laughs> I would certainly do it. But in fact, I've done far more uh, musicals with new scores, classic musicals, mm-hmm. Shakespeare, new plays than mm-hmm. I have in, in this particular genre. So in Ain't Too Proud, I play Eddie Kendricks. Um, he uh, was a crooner, uh, falsetto. Um, they say he was loving, charming, but he was also very protective of the group. I wanted also the audience, so when they're watching them, to feel as though, yes. you know, if I started the show with like an entirely brand new set of steps and vocabulary, it would it would have felt no. distant. So I, I really got to talk to Otis and research uh, David's life and talk to his family and things like that, and really understand how hurt this man was and what he came from and what he ran away from. Now, some people in choir board is a musical, but it's a play, in fact. So yes. how do you choreograph a play? Well, the wonderful thing about Terrell Avon McCarrany's work is that he incorporated spirituals that are over 200 years old Mm. so the rhythm and the movement is already a part of the African tradition so Mm -hmm. even though it is a part of even though it is considered a play, the music brings forth the movement. Wouldn't you like to do a play where you just sit on a park bench like the zoo story for the whole time? I would. I would that would be. In fact, that is the next show I'm doing. I'm announcing it here and now. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm doing zoo story right after this. <laughs> no more would, jumping around. No, I like. It, uh, there's something about an energy of a show that I enjoy being a part of that energy. Right. You know, I've been working on Beetlejuice for over six years. Wow. And we redesigned every single piece of scenery at least 15 times. <laughs> it is by far the most complicated show I've ever worked on. And it's by far the most complicated set I've ever seen. But you chose not to use um, the famous jokes, right? Because it's just they're not going to work out of the context of a movie set in the soap opera world. That, correct. That's true. And also, when you change the story, you know, uh, as we had talked about, y- y- we didn't want the tail to wag the dog. Right. We wanted to figure out what our story was and how these characters navigate this world and then see what from the movie might be able to come and fit into the way we were reinterpreting it. The show is not a, a big send-up of Broadway. That's not the point. Right. But you have to have the workplace scenes. and you do. those. Yeah. Making those rehearsals or or on stage for a Broadway show is really fun. Dorothy Michaels, you know, she she uh, sort of inspires the show to become a, a much better version of itself. So you have to create choreography that's bad, but right. then you have to also create the good version of it, which actually feels like there's a little more pressure on that end <laughs> right. to be like, oh, this is good. I watched it as a kid, uh, and then I rewatched it when I was auditioning, um, and it's just such a classic. I think it still holds up. I, I think it's important for. I think all men should do that. Really, I, I absolutely do. Not only just wear the dress, but go. Live a day, imagine going through what women go through because it is, uh, you know. And I've always thought of myself as a progressive guy, but recognizing what women have to deal with day to day is one thing. Having to experience it mm. and realize that there are extra taxes, like <laughs> pink tax on being waxed, and like all of those, like what the heck is that? Like people are given pepper spray for their birthdays, mm-hmm. girls, like when they graduate. Mm. What? Mm-hmm. Like happy. What? What is that? Designing the costumes, you're do, doing it for three phases of Cher's life. How do you approach that? Well, the three phases, but the thing is, those three women are working together all the time. They're right. always passing right. in the night and right. talking to each other. And it's kind of a very surrealistic kind of a idea that there's three Cher's out there somewhere talking mm-hmm. to each other. <laughs> Take me into that rehearsal room when Cher comes in to watch you play Cher. Well, you know, as you can imagine, the whole energy shifts. Mm-hmm. We want to make her proud. Mm-hmm. She's very authentic and truthful. Mm-hmm. She doesn't put on a smile when she's not happy and right. she doesn't, you know, don tears when they're not real. So you get an immediate um, sort of critical answer where mm-hmm. whenever she's in the room. Have you been in touch with any current members, foreign, uh, former members of the IRA who were around in that period? I'm curious to know how they react to your bringing it up again. 
uh, I haven't been in touch with them. No, um, I, uh, it was it was it was mostly second in terms of contacting the IRA. No, it was it was secondary research. Even though you don't even have to know about the politics of the North of Ireland in 1981, but it, pretty much everybody has heard about the hunger strike. Sure, yeah, and that's of course a central theme in the play. I and mean, it's a play really about how you never can put the past behind you, especially, mm. especially if it's been unresolved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a fundamental theme of the play, and certainly it was a lot of the inspiration for why Jez sat down and came up with the idea in the first place, was to do with that idea of not being able to bury your own past and, not be, and, and the attempt to put ghosts to rest. Why did you right. pick a little thing like the prom? Well, it sort of picked us, <laughs> because we, we, you know, we sort of heard, of, we heard from different... Uh, articles we read and different things about gay kids not being able to go to the prom and we thought you know let's do there's got to be something in there so when you put this character together who are some of the real life divas you based you know there's on? enough in me that <laughs> i didn't have to it was like oh wow why is that so easily accessible for me <laughs> the greatest thing i have learned from them is fearlessness mm. they all are so sure of themselves and so confident and so brave on stage mm -hmm. And the kindest human beings you will ever meet. And, and they're so fun to hang out with and drink with. It's ridiculous. Now, uh, there are pitfalls, though, for adults playing children. Uh, how do you avoid those? You know, you have a really good director and a really yeah. good um, writer. It means so much to the nation, yeah. and it means so much to 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 our audience. But I'll say it also means so much to us. Mm -hmm. And it meant... Uh, I read in the seventh grade. It's how I learned how to be a critical reader, a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. So it's been a really big part of my, my, my learning process. So did you have a kind of different production in mind when you started and it changed think, as I you explored the material? I think I didn't have material? anything in mind. You know, I think when I kind of, if I know what I'm going to make, there's no point right. in making it. When you were growing up, were you an Oklahoma fan or did it seem kind of an old-fashioned type show to it someone a, your age? It was a bit of a slow burn for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't much into it. Um, but having discovered... Uh, through this show, the brilliance of Rodgers and Hammerstein in general, I, I, I feel like a whole world has opened up. And what did you learn from Susan? Because she's such a, a giant in this business, working with her all those years, that you've brought into your career. I mean, she's really the best. She's wonderful with actors. She's wonderful with dancers. She's extremely rhythmical. She's extremely musical. She's extremely organized. Did you know this play before uh, you were approached to do yeah, it? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, I feel like Burn This managed to cross everybody's college syllabus. Ah, uh, really? Um, um, yeah, and it did in mine just with scenes. So I had never actually really read it cover to cover. I had just seen people do scenes from it. Did you ever have a chance to meet Arthur Miller in your uh, travels? I did not, yeah. sadly. I did not. No. I knew him. He used to, he always, you'd call him on the phone and he'd say, and then you'd say, thank you, nice to talk to you, Arthur. He'd say, righto. Did you study any footage of Rupert Murdoch to capture the yeah. physicality? Uh, yes, I did. And um, uh, my process there is. Um, you do as much homework as you can and then um, let your imaginary forces work. Now, it used to be called Torchong Trilogy. I noticed you uh, lopped off Trilogy. Uh, that was, was that a producerial decision? <laughs> I said, Harvey, it's time to do Torchong, but we have to cut the word Trilogy. <laughs> no, he did not. He was not mean to me. Yeah. Now you're writing for characters who aren't you. Yeah, I've always been interested in story songs. You know, mm -hmm. I love folk music. I love balladry, especially mm -hmm. like stuff from the British Isles and oh, yeah, yeah. Um, seven minute songs that it, that have a beginning, middle and end. And so in a way, it's not that much of a leap. Can you take me back to the very first person you, you knew in your life who had AIDS? Um, the first person I knew that died was a wonderful actor named Bobby Christian, and he and we had been at the O'Neill Playwrights Foundation um, that summer, and I read about his passing. I think it was in Backstage. We have a revival coming of one of your uh, wonderful plays, uh, Frankie and Johnny in the Claire de Lune. Can you give me a sense of uh, what inspired you to write that play when you did? What was going on in your life then? Well, it was kind of the height of the age crisis, yeah. the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure of the city was collapsing. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be someone with a greasy rag, everywhere wiping your windshield. Yeah, the squeegee man. Uh, and it was the first time people were saying, I think I might move somewhere from New York. Well, to keep the feeling of the Motown sound right. and, and not turn it into a Broadway sounding show, right. uh, I deal with 
the characters, the emotions, and so forth. So when I write a string line, mm -hmm. it's not a string line just because this is a nice string line for a pop record. Right. This is a nice string line for the scene. And for this character in this particular in emotional that particular, moment. In that particular moment, yeah. You directed the original production of Angels in America on Broadway, and in that play, Tony was doing everything too. You had melodrama, you had poetry, you had philosophy, you had epic theater, you had naturalistic theater, Absolutely. all of these elements. Absolutely, and, and, but that's, and, and that's called our life in contemporary America. It is an absurdist comedy that can be sentimental one minute and a horror show the next. Yeah. And that's just the way life is, and so theater should be reflective of that. It is indeed. All right. George, always a pleasure right. to talk to you. Congratulations. You. Okay, take care. iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz. The best or nothing.